The Incident Response Plan will be the guiding document for your incident response team. The NIST SP800-61 is an excellent guide for creating your plan and helping in setting up an incident response strategy. It will help you document the process needed to investigate an incident. It will also help you understand all the things you need to have a strategy to help you mitigate whatever happened. This will include containing and recovering from the incident. A critical part of your response plan should be identifying what needs to be documented. Things should be documented. This documentation will be used to feed back into your plan and help you refine your strategy for dealing with future incidents. An incident response plan can be broken up a number of ways. We will use this outline for this video presentation, but don't feel like it's the only way to proceed. Regardless of how you put your plan together, it should cover all of these areas. Incident alert mechanisms. These will be how alerts are communicated to your response team. This should cover monitoring hardware and software, but also include how people will communicate alerts. Forming a team. This will cover what kind of team should be put together, what skills and talents are needed. If you are a large project, you might be able to have one or several full-time people assigned to incident response. More likely, you'll have to assign someone the added responsibility of dealing with incidents on top of their current assignment. We'll cover team structure in more detail later. Contact information and incident reporting mechanisms. This is trying to establish your process and plans around that and trying to document those so that your team knows what needs to be done in this area. Team coordination and communications. How does the team go about setting up communications between members and individuals that need to be reported to? This should identify secure communications channels. When the team is discussing the incident, you want to be fairly certain that no one's listening in on that discussion. Monitoring, as we mentioned earlier, monitoring is crucial to knowing if something is going on. This plan should identify what and how things are monitored. Finally, log management. As you are monitoring your system, you'll be collecting logs. How and where will those be stored? How long will you save them? These are things that should be defined by your plan. Something that is very important when it comes to incident response is that people need to know who it is they can talk to. It's not unusual to have a good security team, but no one knows how to contact them. The flip side of this is also true. People need to know what information is needed before contacting the team. It's not an uncommon occurrence for a user to contact a help desk with an issue in the middle of the night, and the help desk fails to get the needed information. Because of this, you might waste a lot of time investigating something that was never an incident or trying to rediscover the event that caused the person to alert you. Having a process in place helps you understand who in your organization needs to be contacted. It gives instructions on how to contact them and what information you need to give to them when you do contact them. This is all very important information that users need and also your security team needs. Make sure you spend the time gathering this information and documenting it well in your incident plan. Another basic item that is needed when developing an incident response plan is some kind of trouble tracking ticket system. These systems become important when tracking an incident and help you verify that you've covered everything. It's not uncommon for one main big alert to go off that alerts you to an incident, but then also to have multiple other things going on at the same time. Unless you are very organized, it becomes easy to lose sight of some of the smaller things going on. It is easy to lose sight of the forest because you're busy with one tree. Having a tracking system allows you to capture everything and then verify that everything has been addressed. The system allows you to identify who is working on what and when. This is all important information that will be needed later when reporting on the incident in the post-incident phase. When forming a team, you need to be able to decide who's on the team and who's leading the team. There are a lot of cases that the incident response team gets pulled in as needed. It may be that you have a different lead every time, or you have a well-established lead that's always in charge. When selecting a leader for an incident, you'll want to make sure that person has enough experience that they know what steps need to be taken 
and how to proceed with the handling of an incident. We have found at N.C.S.A., after dealing with many incidents and many trying and difficult situations, that one of the best qualities you can have in the person leading the incident response is that of being calm. Someone who is calm in the midst of the storm is very helpful. While others are running around worried and nervous, it is helpful to have a leader who is calm and methodically going through the steps, making assignments, and making sure things are getting done. Having someone with pretty good networking expertise is also important. A lot of your information comes from the network, so you'll need someone who can understand it. Someone who understands what your key applications are and how they work and how to control them is knowledge that is needed on the team too. And finally, you need someone with an understanding of security. If you have an incident response team and no one on it understands computer security, you're pretty much starting behind the eight ball. Once you've made sure you have defined the skill sets you need for your team and selected individuals to be on the team, you need to define the roles. Like any organization, roles help members understand what their responsibilities are. The leader is very important if you have multiple people involved. Maybe you have somebody who's more focused on doing the analysis or somebody who's a really good system administrator. They might be more focused on containing the incident and wanting to put more systems and services in place for monitoring and containment. Outside resources may also be brought in. Those resources may be people in other groups or organizations, people in other departments on campus, or people outside of your organization that become involved. You need to understand what roles and responsibilities each of those have, and likewise, they need to understand the roles of the people they'll be interfacing with. When putting a team together, it's a little like working with software. You don't want three people doing the same thing, each doing it in a different way all at the same time. It's just not going to work out. So make sure people understand what their role is and make sure you define those well in your plan. Identifying subject matter experts. Even if you have an expert team in house, there's still a need for subject matter experts. They might be an expert on the resource that you're investigating as part of the problem. They might be an expert on the application or about the specific technique that is being used. These people may be within your organization or from the outside. At NCSA, we've called them these kinds of experts a number of times when dealing with problems. They have come from both inside and outside the organization. Getting help from people who are experts in the problem you're dealing with is a great resource and should not be overlooked. The types of teams you could run into are varied. In many cases, for small projects, it's unlikely they will have a full-time team to deal with these problems. Many smaller projects might think they can count on the university to have an incident response team. And while this is true, it's important to remember that these teams will be more focused on isolating the systems that are having a problem and getting them offline before they can affect anything else on campus. They don't always have the luxury of going through the details of what's going on. Therefore, this is an important conversation you should have with the campus resources to see what help they do offer when it comes to incident response. They might also have contacts with campus legal and law enforcement that could be very helpful. In other cases, there might be a single full-time person assigned to security for a project. This person's full responsibility is to focus on system security and deal with incident response. This means that each time there is an incident, they will be recreating a team, pulling various people in for help. Of course, the most typical case is the other duties is assigned case. This means that if something happens, management picks someone and gives them the responsibility to deal with the problem. It is a new duty that is assigned to them for the life of the incident. This is a very typical situation, so don't feel embarrassed if this is your situation. Just realize it means you have to take your policies and procedures more seriously so that the newly assigned incident handling person has a good guide. A newer type of team that you're beginning to see more of is a distributed team. Exceed is an example of this. There are multiple organizations that are part of Exceed, and they have a reliance on each other and support each other, so incident response might be responding to a problem on our individual system 
but we might be working with other sites on understanding what might be going on and figuring things out. If you are setting up a team for the first time, some of the skills you will want your team leader to have include the ability to communicate. They need to be able to talk to people. The leader also needs to be able to document things. They can't just talk tech speak. They need to be able to turn what is going on into terms that people in the organization who accept risk, the managers, and upper leadership, so that these leaders will know how to guide you and what to do with your response. Diplomacy is needed because you get further when you have someone who can talk to people rather than just brute forcing things. They need to be organized because, as we said earlier, there are often lots of things going on during an incident. It usually isn't just one thing that needs to be investigated. The leader needs to be working multiple situations all at the same time. Obviously, integrity is needed. The leader can't just go through and violate all the policies just because they feel like it. They need to abide by the policies in place and adhere to a code of conduct. Coping with stress is important in the leader. They can't get all frantic and worried about what's going on. If they are acting that way, the rest of the team and management are going to be even worse. The leader needs to be able to deal calmly with the situation and guide the team through the incident. As for team members, it's important to remember that each individual team member does not need to have all of these skills, but all these skills should be found within the team. Networking expertise is at the top because it is probably the most important. Understanding the network is very important. If you look at a lot of self-taught security people, they come from a networking background. That's where they grew out of. Incident response, a lot of times, at least this was the case 20 years ago, was the duty of network administrators. They were the ones who knew about the firewalls. They were the ones who could block a problem. Network administrators are the ones with a very good understanding of attack patterns because the attack typically comes through the network. Having knowledge about applications is pretty important too. These people will notice something unusual or different with things like port configurations or how the system is set up. They will also know what applications the vulnerabilities are. Host and system expertise is very critical because once you get into an incident itself, Understanding what the attacker could have done is important. Having knowledge of the host or specific system becomes a great need. These people can identify changes that have been made. Someone who stays up to date on the malicious code that's out there, including viruses and the likes, and probably knows about patches and solutions or other cases becomes pretty important. Over the years, NCSA has been hit by a number of things that were similar to events at other sites, and we were able to work through hours quickly because someone was keeping up on that and knew what to do. And then programming skills. A lot of your mitigation strategies and how to deal with it, at least in the short term, end up being somebody who knows how to write a script really quick, or write a program, or improve a filter or a block. All of that can protect you against the incident in the immediate moment while you get a handle on the whole solution. If you would like more help with building a security system, please contact CTSC. You can get contact and other information on the CTSC website, trustedci.org. CTSC Online is made possible by funding from NSF, grant number OCI 1234408.